Hello, 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 and welcome to another episode of Across the Dinerverse, searching for the heart and soul of America one diner at a time. How you doing? I'm John Murphy, writer and producer on the TV series Innovation Nation, which airs Saturday mornings on CBS. And I also fly, drive, train, whatever, all across the country, talking to people over local moco, chilequiles, and peanut butter pancakes about their lives, their hometown, and how they feel about America. And I can absolutely tell you, after doing a dozen of these podcasts so far, people have stories. Oh my God, do they have stories. I really can't believe what they're willing to share with me. And if you're new to the podcast, there are seven other episodes you can check out right now. So please subscribe to Across the Dinerverse wherever you get your podcasts. And I really appreciate it. And don't miss a single one. Now, this week's episode is a bonus because I'm traveling to IEA Hawaii, which is just outside of Pearl Harbor on the island of Oahu, to record a new episode at a diner called The 49er. And it's been there since 1947. Why didn't they call it the 47er? I don't, the 47. Why the 49er? We'll find out, all right? The 49er coming up very soon from Aie, Hawaii. And in case you are unaware, my goal is to do at least one podcast from a diner in all 50 states. And if you'd like to help me achieve that, just go to my Patreon page at patreon.com backslash dinerverse. And for a couple of bucks a month, you get some behind the scenes and bonus content that's only for you. Just just a little gift for you. That's patreon.com backslash dinerverse. Okay, why is this a shorter bonus episode? Last week, I did a podcast called Crimes and Misdemeanors from Randy's Southside Diner in Grand Junction, Colorado. And Grand Junction has a pretty high crime rate for a small city, and we get into that. So after I left Randy's, I checked into a Courtyard Marriott. And that night, you know, I went to the lounge to eat something, have a drink, just relax. And of course, what happens? I meet a guy. That's right, I meet a guy. And we start talking, and I told him what I what I do. And he said, oh, I've got a story for you. I said, sure. Okay, all right, let's do this. So I went back to my room, got my microphones, and we met and set off in a corner away from the lounge to chat. And like I said, and I always say this, everybody's got a story. Hello, sir. What is your name? My name's Keith. Hi, Keith. How are you? Fantastic. Thank you. Where do you live? Um, right now, Seattle is, uh, is my hometown. So we're kind of talking about crime on this show and how crime, like in Grand Junction, is kind of rampant right now. I mean, they have a lot of you know small time kind of crime, but it's like drug oriented, violent crime. Crime in America is kind of on the increase. Have you been a victim of crime? Well, let me ask you this question: Have you ever committed a crime? Well, uh, I guess uh, back before uh, weed was legal, uh, yes, I, I I've committed many crimes, smoking a lot of weed. But uh, so you partake? I I do. Uh-huh. I was born on four twenty. Were you really? Oh yes, yes, four twenty. That's hilarious. Time. Coincidence, or do you not think so? I like to think not. <laughs> so you fully embrace the 420. I have. What did you do on April 20th, 2020? I had a great big birthday planned, uh, an extravaganza. That was the start of the pandemic. Oh, and that's, so yeah, of course. My birthday, which was uh, going to be an actual concert, uh, was absolutely blown out of the water Um and uh, so it never happened, and uh, that was a true disappointment. It was actually one of the biggest regrets of my life. Why? You say a concert. Were you going to perform the concert? Yeah, yeah, actually, that's what I do for a living. And, uh, oh, and you're a musician. Yes, exactly. And I had uh, all kinds of uh, special guests uh, from the keyboard player, Spike Edney from Queen, um, wow. Teddy Andretis uh, from uh, Guns N' Roses. Um, How do you know all those guys? Just through a lifetime of music. I, I have lived in L.A. for a long time right. and uh, was a studio musician in, in L.A. So, yeah, just, just through a course of longevity in the music industry. But 
I've had a crime committed to me. What happened? So I've, I've got a pretty crazy life story. It, it, it all started when I was about five years old. My mother and father were getting a divorce. So to hurt my mother and my family, my father actually kidnapped me. And <gasps> no, we disappeared for 13 years before I found out that I... I had a family in L.A. again. You and didn't remember them from being five years old? What was really strange is as I was growing up, I would always have these uh, kind of flashes in, in, in my mind of people that I knew at some point in time. And I could picture places with these people, but I, I didn't know exactly who they were. And my father had gone through my whole lifetime telling me that my mother and family had died in a car accident oh. and that it was just us. Oh, man. And when I had asked about my grandparents, he had said that uh, they had died of cancer and, uh, you know, pretty much the whole family was gone. So so how did you find out that you were actually kidnapped? So that happened through a, a very another interesting story that uh, when I was approaching 18 years of age, my father and I had a kind of uh, strained relationship over the years, imagine that. Um, and I had moved out from his house when I was about 15, and I lived on my own for about three years until I needed to get uh, a vehicle. At that time, I, I got this vehicle, and, and I, typical teenager, you know, went racing down the road uh, at 100 miles an hour and was in an accident. And I fractured my neck. So that led me, my father, because I wasn't 18 yet, had to come and get me out of the hospital. The nurses had noticed that there were different mother's maiden names on different uh, certificates. Like my birth certificate said one thing. And then Social Security said something else. And Your father had concocted this whole different identity, life identity, maybe for himself and for you after he kidnapped you. Absolutely, yeah. Wow. We, uh, you know, he had changed our our names like right off the bat, and you know, as a as a kid, I remember sitting in an automotive, you know, repair shop parking lot somewhere in Salt Lake City, and he said, you know, we we need to change our names. You know, what name do you want to uh, have? <laughs> And, uh, what? and I remember that, uh, you know, I saw on the auto, uh, or automotive repair shop, it said Brown's auto repair. And I said, I couldn't think of anything cause I was a kid. So I'm like, well, Brown, you know, you know, let's, let's change our name to Brown. Did he do that? Yeah. For a short period of time, our last name was Brown. You're in this accident. You're in the hospital. The nurses start asking questions about the veracity of these birth certificates and social security names how things don't match up what happened then uh at that time he, he had remarried and had a had a new wife and which they they had a daughter with and so she didn't have any inkling you know that this guy she married had a totally different life a past life that she so he wasn't honest about. with her either no no nobody knew this you know nobody knew anything about this and so I had come from home from the hospital, and, and she had uh, was making dinner, and she started asking him, like, hey, why, are the, why is the hospital asking all these questions about who you are and, and what, what, these, what these different names, you know, are? And it really caught him off guard. You could tell, you know, that, you know, a lifetime of running from the law. You know, and I, I used to be a kid on a milk carton, you know, missing children's, you know, back Really? You were one of the... I remember that from the 80s. That was a big thing. Missing children on school milk cartons. Have you seen this kid? Right. There was no internet, you know, back at that time, right? If, you know, my picture was literally on a milk carton. and As a kidnapped and, uh, child. As a kidnapped child, the FBI were, were looking for me. How come they never um, tracked him down? You guys like live off the grid or something? Or? Well, yeah, I mean, he was he was quite crafty at, at, at you know at uh, changing you know our names and, and documentation and stuff. But you know, it, it finally all kind of came to a head. You know, at that time, that it all kind of caught up to him. I mean, he didn't imagine himself getting in a situation where you know they were pulling records and documentation that you know would have any indication of our past. 
and he had made some flaws, you know, by creating these different names, and and uh, and it, it all kind of just caught up with him. So what happened? How did you finally know that a family existed somewhere else? Where was this family? So yeah, at the at the uh, time uh, he had moved us uh, all the way up to Seattle, and uh, you know, all my family uh, lived in L.A. You know, at this dinner, uh, she was pressing him for what was, you know, what was going on. You know, something was very strange, obviously. And he turned to me and, and just said, hey, you know, change the subject. I'll tell you whatever you want to know tomorrow, you know, but just change the subject now, you know. And I could see it in his face, you know. He's sweating. He's pure red. You know, that th this is all kind of coming to a head. And like I said, I, now all of these flashes that I've had in my head my whole life of these people and these places now starts to, you know, is starting to make sense. It's kind of starting to, it's like having a puzzle that, you know, that you're trying to figure out. And then slowly the, the puzzle starts to come together. So the next day I, I, uh, I approach him and, uh, and I'm like, you know, what the hell is going on? And uh, I'll never forget this. He, he's, he's like, you're not who you think you are. Oh, my God. And you're 18 years old. Yeah. And I'm like... How did that hit you? What was your emotional reaction? How did you take it in? Well, you know, as you can imagine, I, I, I'm like, what, what does that even mean? You know, I'm not who I think I am. And he's like, you have a family. And I'm like, what family? You know, the, the people that you've said have been dead my whole life. He just said, well, you have grandparents. He wouldn't admit even at that point to uh, that my mother was still alive. And he said that you have grandparents who live down in Pasadena. And I said, well, what, what's this about? I, I'm not who I think I am, you know? And, and uh, he's like, well, it's a, you have a totally different name. I said, so, you know, my grandfather's last name. He said, yeah. After that conversation, I, I left the house and you know, this is back in the day before cell phones. So I had to hitch a ride to a friend's house in which I went and used, you know, their phone called information. He wouldn't even let you use the phone at your own house. Well, I didn't I didn't want to, you know, because I didn't want to have a conversation in front of, you know, my father who I didn't know if I could trust, could trust anymore, yeah. you know. So I decided to go to a friend's house. And so I called information, and uh, you know this is this is all in a time you know before the internet, so and and cell phones and everything. So getting this information was a little bit more difficult, right? So I just happened to call the operator and said, you know, uh, I'm looking for this person, um, you know, in Pasadena, and they said, well, that person doesn't exist in Pasadena, but we have somebody in San Dimas that uh, that matches that. And I said, well, you know, I'll give it a shot. They gave me that number, and I called it. At the time, I didn't realize, you know, it was my grandmother who answered the phone, but I, but I asked for my, my grandfather, his name, and, and, uh, and she said, well, he's not here right now. He's out on a golfing trip. Can I give him your name and have him call you? And I paused, and I said, well, quite truthfully, I, I don't know if he even knows who I am. And there was a long pause, which was, which was, and I could just feel like the hair on my arms and my neck, like, you know, uh, sure. you know, it, it just, it, it, it was a very odd and strange phone call. But my grandmother said, oh my God, she goes, is this by chance regarding a son? And I said, well, I, th I think so. Yes. And she goes, is this little Keithy? Oh, and, oh and, uh, God. You know that's uh, what that, how did that make real. you feel when she said, "Are you like little Keithy?" I was very you know hard emotionally wise, you know what I mean because obviously i'd I'd made a connection to people who I believed were were gone my whole life, you know man, and, and uh, it was very emotional, of course, so did you ever confront your father and why did you do this? Why go through all this? What was the point? So th that came many years later after the fact, but I had mentioned that I, I, uh, I thought my mother was still, you know, dead and my grandmother informed me, no, no, you know, your, your mother's still alive. And so are all your, 
brothers and sisters and and you have a huge family which that led to that night she said i'm obviously going to have your your mother call you and uh which then became another very strange phone call because you know i hadn't talked to my mom since i was five years old and did the memories come flooding back when you heard her voice did you like start to put things together oh yeah yeah i remember your face i waited at my friend's house uh you know um, because once again you know i had to wait by a phone right and so uh i waited for that phone call that night in which you know my friends and i were supposed to be going to a a rock concert. It was it was Motley Crue at the Tacoma Dome, and uh, and I guess you didn't make that show. Well, we didn't make the beginning, but uh, you know, all these friends came over and their parents stopped to to stay and and listen because uh, they're like, oh my gosh, this you know big big event. You know, uh, Keith's going to talk to his mother for the first time in thirteen years. You oh. know. But finally, my mom called, and and uh, it was extremely uh, emotional, and you know, and everything. You know, I, I left the next day to fly down to California. I didn't return back to Seattle for many years, and I and I didn't talk to my father. I mean, you just for, left the next day and never came back. Yeah, yeah. I you I, took the clothes in your back and a suitcase, and that yep, was it. That was it. When I flew in, you know, to L.A., uh, you know, there was all kinds of news cameras and magazines and newspapers and stuff there. And, and, uh, and it was, it was, it was, it was such a surreal event because I waited to, till I was the last one to get off the plane, uh, because I wasn't quite sure, you know, if I, you know, you got to think I haven't seen my mother and brother and sisters and grandparents in 13 years. I don't know what they look like. I don't, I don't know anything, right? You know, so the stewardesses came up to me on the uh, and said, "Hey, are is your name Keith?" and 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 I said, uh, "I said yes, yes it is." And they said, uh, "Are you famous or something?" Not that I know of. And they said, "Well, there's a huge crowd of people, you know, waiting outside this plane for you right now." <laughs> and uh when i came out on the 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 off ramp of the plane at the time of course there was a massive crowd and i just remember this roar of people but i and i came down the ramp and when i did i just got smothered by this this huge crowd and what was so surreal is that you know i have my my mother hugging me my grandmother you know my my uh my sisters i don't know who they are so they're giving you all this love and affection, and it's totally foreign to you. You don't. You're exactly. trying to process it all. Exactly. Did you turn your father in? Did you tell the FBI where he was? Two FBI agents came to the house, and uh, it's still a, an open case, you know. Okay. And so, you know, to close the case, they say, "Listen, you have still have the ability to prosecute him." At this point, I feel I'm an an adult now. I, I say, you know, as long as he stays where he is and and whatnot, and I'm where I'm at. I didn't see the need to continue it farther. And that's you what did know, your mom think of that? I think she she kind of agreed. At the time, everybody was as happy about being reunited again, you know. So so the joy of just being back together, Trump trying to get a pound of flesh and sending him off to prison, even though he probably certainly deserved it. Everybody had been through enough turmoil already. Mm -hmm. And so the thought was that let's, let's move forward from here. Did you ever hear what went down? How did he kidnap you? My mother was able to share uh, with me the night that that happened. Um, She had a restraining order against him. He wasn't allowed in the house, but at at three o'clock in the morning, he had broken through uh, a side door uh, in the house, and I was sick at the time. Uh, I had bronchitis. I was sleeping next to my mom, and he picked me up. He put a hammer next to my mom's bedstand, and he called her at uh, like three o'clock, three thirty in the morning, from a payphone, and uh, said, "In case you haven't noticed." I've taken Keith, and you'll never see him again in your lifetime, and you'll never know what happened to him, and 
you're lucky that I didn't kill you, you know? And he goes, look, look at the, the nightstand. And that was it. He hung up the phone and I disappeared for 13 years. Oh my God. How has that affected your life? This, you know, being kidnapped, being disassociated, uh, disconnected from your real family. Did you feel like you were living in hiding as a kid growing up? On the run, kind of? Did you move around it, a lot? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we were, for for a period of a couple of years, I, I know that we moved around, you know, quite a few times. And in fact, you know, we were in uh, Salt Lake City, and he had uh, solicited the help of the Mormon church there. He got He had gotten into the church only to get their help. He was a con man. Yeah. He basically had started a a ranch there. And one night he came to me in the middle of the night and he's like, we got to, we got to go right now, right now. He goes, grab whatever you can in the next five minutes and we're gone. And, you know, out on the road, you know. Did he pretend to be a Mormon? Did he like join the church and became a Mormon faithful follower just to Money, help, exactly, exactly. Favors yeah. from the Mormon community. Yeah, yeah. At the for a short time, but it, then you know, obviously, somebody found something out, Dang. and uh, and we just disappeared in the middle of the night. They were helping him build a house and a ranch, and giving him all all kinds of help, and and like uh, just in a moment's notice, we were gone. Wow. Like, How do you think that's affected your life? What struggles have you had because of finding all this out? Do you have trust issues with people? You know, definitely it makes you, I think I have a deeper vision into possibilities of what can happen in life, you know, with, and with people. When you meet somebody, we get to know them, maybe there's a little bit of, okay, this person's son nice, but maybe they could flip on me. Yeah. I mean, look at, you know, he lived for 13 years as a total double lifestyle. Uh, his wife wasn't even aware of who he was. And and neither was I as his own child, you know, even being around him. I wasn't aware of who he was. You said you're a musician. Did music help heal you? Was that a healing way for you to kind of get over it and find yourself? Absolutely. That's that's where I, I, I gravitated to and, and, and absolutely used that as as uh as a therapy and really immersed myself in, in that, you know. It was a way that I could, you know, show emotion, show feelings. In a, in a family unit, you know, with my father, that was very difficult to show your feelings and, and whatnot. So You said you were a studio musician. What instruments do you play? Mainly mainly guitar, but, you know, I write. And How did you learn how to play the guitar? Are you self-taught? I started, uh, you know, taking guitar lessons in uh, the, the small town that we lived in at an early age. You know, I, I would actually strap my... A guitar on my back and ride my bike into town and go to a, a little music store that was there. And I was very fortunate that the guy who taught guitar there was really good. And, and then always knew that, you know, uh, I, I wanted, you know, to do music for a living. And that helped when I moved uh, back down to California because I was able to then parlay that into getting hooked up with some big studio musicians in L.A. Like uh, who? You know who? Uh, Carl Verheyen from Super Tramp, big uh, studio musician. Wow. Um, you know, jazz and blues legend Robin Ford. Uh, I wish we could hear you play. I always travel with a guitar, and I actually uh, got one out in the trunk of the, the car. You know, Do you we'll really? Have to, we'll have to run out to the parking lot. Would you, would you really go out and do that? Why not, you know? Okay. Wait, rock and roll. All right, we'll take five, and, uh, and we'll come back, and maybe we'll hear Keith play. Okay, so while Keith's getting his guitar out of his car, let me tell you what's coming up on future episodes of Across the Dinerverse. America this week is reeling from a wave of mass shootings. There's been so many mass shootings in America just in January of this year, it's hard to imagine it keeps happening. And in California, we've had two mass shootings in the same week this week around Chinese New Year celebrations leaving 18 people dead. California's Governor Gavin Newsom called the Second Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, which allows citizens to legally own firearms, now calls it a suicide pact. So I recently traveled to the heart of where people unanimously support gun ownership, Alpine, Wyoming. 
in a diner called Yankee Doodles, and it doesn't get any more all-American than that. And despite deadly recent events, the people in Alpine and the surrounding area in Wyoming really, and literally, stick to their guns. And that's the episode that's coming up very, very soon. All right, so I hope you'll tune in for that. A whole episode about the Second Amendment from Yankee Doodles in Alpine, Wyoming. It'll be a very, very interesting and tough discussion. But now, let's get back to Grand Junction, Colorado. Oh man, look at that. Here he comes. He's got the acoustic guitar. He is uh, sitting back into the uh, table with this. And wow. You just carry this in your in your car. It, you break out. You play in street corners for dimes. What? Well, you know, you, you gotta you gotta come armed. You know, you gotta <laughs> when when you're playing out. You know, you gotta okay. You gotta have it right. All right, you gonna play something for us? Go ahead. All right, let's uh, let's uh, let's do something from uh, from the road here for you. All right. dark and brooding song for a dark and brooding life yeah yeah, yeah. but i you, you know you seem like you're happy now you seem like you're what what's your life like are, are you married do you have kids or anything like that no kids you know and, uh, never you know wanted to have kids because uh, just probably you know what happened to me in i'm my sure life. that's true i get that how do things stand with your father now he uh, passed away now uh, quite a while ago about 15 years ago but we were able to uh reconcile you know after after the did he ever say he was sorry he did he did say that he was sorry you know my response for that was that uh i can forgive but i can never forget that's true that's true The, the forgiveness is actually for your healing so you don't carry that around with you all the time but that doesn't mean you have to let them back into your life yeah i'm sorry that he passed but i'm glad you guys had some kind of you know reconciliation at least at the end did that life experience inform your music? It did. I feel the road and the experiences on the journey of the road are the stories that we tell through music. And that's what I, I bring with me, is a story. And sometimes I tell it with the guitar. And, you know, sometimes uh, I run into somebody, uh, you know, doing a that's, podcast. This is cra- that's nuts. This is crazy. All right. Well, give us some blues on the way out. Let's do it, man. All right, Keith, thank you so much for being and welcome to the Diner Burst here in Grand Junction, Colorado. I love it. All I right. love it. Deserves a round of applause. All right, thank you, Keith, for the live performance there in Grand Junction, Colorado. And by the way, this is the studio sound of Keith Brock. That's his name, Brock, Keith Brock. He has a band called The Kings Who Rock. And this track that you're listening to right now is on a new upcoming album he's going to release. And he's playing with the blues legend and blues traveler frontman John Popper on the harmonica. The dude is connected and he knows how to play. So check out his website, Keith Brock and the Kings Who Rock.com. And uh, you know, download the album if you like it, all right? And that wraps up this bonus episode of Across the Dinerverse. Searching for the heart and soul of America, one diner at a time. I'm John Murphy. What's your story?